times were you'd pop on a pair of trainers and run, and whatever was happening on the inside was a mystery as great as why do we only need the toilet one kilometre into our run and not before it. But times change, and now with so much wearable tech at our disposal, we can be the masters of our own body. From learning about blood lactate, to our heart rate, the makeup of our sweat and how to replace it, our bone density, there is so much. But something I've been particularly fascinated about is what goes on inside me when it comes to the food I eat and the energy it then provides me. Are there things I can learn that can take my running to the next level? Well. The only way to find out is to wear a continuous blood glucose monitor similar to those that type 2 diabetics use to see how the nutrition I put in turns into the energy I need. And I've got to tell you, I learned some pretty mind-blowing stuff about myself and I've definitely taken my running to the next level because of it. So here's the plan. This is the sensor. It's applied a little bit like an EpiPen. You put it on your skin, press these two buttons at the side and it fires a needle into your skin so that it can take continuous readings of your blood glucose. This is the thing that transmits it to my phone and gives me three minute real time data as to what's happening with my blood sugar. And I'm just, I'm basically just gonna wear it. Right, excuse me for showing my stomach, but it's going here. To press the unlock. So now it's ready to fire into me. As Soon as you put this on, it's like, it's so sticky. Okay, ready. It's gonna go there. Ready. Three, two, one. Ooh! There is now, there is now a needle in me, in here. So what I now have to do, I have to attach the actual transmitter it is now attached so so eventually that is going to link up to an app on my phone i'll show you then it'll start giving me the data and i can tell you what i learned The first lesson turned out to actually be the most expensive of the lot and although it didn't necessarily give me information on my running, it did make me realise this was going to be trickier than I first thought because we went out for our long run for some testing. Welcome to my Sunday aerobic long run which is a bold plan today. So while we're keeping it easy, I'm testing three different products, two gels and a carb drink mix because I thought why not throw that into the mix if you'll pardon the pun because of course there are products like Bix and Tailwind on the market and even Morton do a version of this that might potentially hit the bloodstream quicker so it'd be interesting to know. But as positive as the majority of the actual run was. I'm not 100% sure here so don't quote me on this because I have to look but pretty sure that 10k I just ran because of the cooler weather I just ran a sub 40 10k easy in not even top of zone 2 about 6-7 beats off the top of zone 2. That's, that's madness, and that's not, not just down to the gels. The weather is so kind at the moment. I encountered a problem though. I've encountered quite a major problem here only a few days in. This is the sensor that was attached here, but the sweat, like the heat of this country has just meant that the sensor can't handle being stuck to my skin and it's fallen off like while I'm running. So I don't really know what to do. I'm gonna have to come up with another plan. Potentially I'm gonna have to buy more applicators and just they're gonna come off every few days <laughs> which is gonna cost a fortune but I am dead set on doing this test so I'll put another one on me later today and we'll go again so the implications for diabetics at least are not great in hot and humid countries but I was determined to make this work <laughs> Can I just say, I don't need to put too much more ice in, it's already cold, Mary's been in. Just a bit more. Oh. Oh, it's cold enough. So the idea here is, or my theory is that my blood glucose is going to drop and, and doing a little bit of research into it it sounds like the more you do cold exposure 
the better your body becomes at regulating your insulin. It becomes more sensitive with cold exposure. There is a lot more research that is required, but think about it. Having a body that's better able to regulate your blood sugar, the implications of that as a runner are much more stable performances when it comes to racing or even training, as well as better recovery post-workout. And even though I had this ice bath quite soon after a meal, when my blood glucose should be on the rise, it reduced quite dramatically, enough to give me a warning on the app. Okay, that's six minutes, and that's the thing. It doesn't need to <laughs> be so cold. It doesn't need to be that long. It's more about consistency than it is like staying in there for 10 to 15 minutes. I think the evidence says somewhere between three and six minutes is absolutely fine two to three times a week. The other thing about doing ice baths that I love beyond the glucose stuff is the buzz that it gives you afterwards. It does definitely release endorphins. So it makes you feel like really clear of mind for a while. So that's another side bonus to the whole process. probably tell from the shadows it's late night I've only just got home and I've got a run but actually it's worth it because it can kind of help me prove this next point and that is that when I started this process also I'm doing a video by the way on which gels are the most effective for me but what surprised me was how much of an impact gels actually had to my running uh, but it's I don't think the way that you would expect or certainly not that I expected I'm going to go in way more depth, specifically on gels, in a separate video, but one thing I noticed through that process of testing was that gels rarely had the impact that I was expecting. Like I thought that they would be this silver bullet, something I could take that would pull my run or my race back from the brink, but really, a lot of the time the gel impact was minimal. Sometimes it didn't even raise my blood sugar at all. It was all very dependent on a load of factors like time of day, how far away I was from a previous meal, how I felt or what the session was like. And while patterns kind of emerged, like afternoons were better than mornings for my response, it was still quite variable. I feel like people overestimate what gels do for you generally, but knowing that the response is not as big as I thought just makes me all the more bought into having a really good carb load and a really good race nutrition plan, having seen what could happen if I don't. And that's it. This is what the pattern has been time and time and time again. Um, you just don't know how it's gonna go, I guess. Let's have a look. <clears throat> Case in point here, I'll put this on screen, but if you look where my run started and then there was the small dip after the run at just a tiny bump after I'd started running from the gel um, and it held for a little while and then there's a dramatic dip. So almost I would say the gel, not that it didn't have any effect, but the effect was so staggeringly small in comparison to what I would imagine when you take what in my head is like full sugar. You see much more dramatic spikes from things like orange juice than you do this. So I think the benefit of the gels are more when you use them cumulatively than when you use them in isolation. And that's something that I didn't really appreciate. So you would have to compound them in a marathon over and over on top of each other for them to have an effect on you for the long term. Just one or one with too much space in between the next, it's, it's not gonna do the job for your training and that really surprised me. But the video about each individual gel, which ones are best and how they work for my body, now that's a completely different video coming soon. Another thing I noticed that definitely needs more exploring is that there was a couple of times while I was doing this experiment where either the air quality index, the AQI here, was really high, like bad for your health. And there was one time where I was, I'd call it under the weather, I wouldn't say I was full blown ill, but I was under the weather. And both times, my blood glucose were really low. And I thought that was weird, because why would it be low in both illness and in AQI? Like what would be, what's going on inside my body that would cause that? Oh, by the way, you're joining me on a 400 meter repeat session. I may live to regret saying this, but I'm aiming for 20 400 meter repeats. Wish me luck. 
So when you do a bit of research into what happens to your blood glucose in poor air quality or illness, they both say the same thing. Both of these events reduce your insulin sensitivity and therefore your ability to control your blood glucose. But I couldn't work out why most of the research suggested you should have high blood glucose in these circumstances. I've taken a breather between the 10th and the 11th rep because that's brutal heat. But what got me thinking is, why would my blood glucose be, would there be a reason for it, put it that way? Is there a reason for my glucose being lower in the AQI and, and illness? Is it just me? Should, is that what I should see? So I started digging into a bit of research. Here we go, 12th rep. So, from what I can find, blood glucose and the levels, high or low, are quite individual. Illness could increase your blood glucose or it could drop it, and for me, it dropped it. And that has some quite serious ramifications if I have a race or a hard session. Start on the low end and then start using your blood glucose in a session and you can quite quickly turn hypoglycemic, which by the way is the most common reason for hitting the wall in a race or bonking during a session. You need to be aware, I guess, that potentially when you're ill, you need to tune into your body more because you could also have high blood sugar, not low. So it's not as simple as fuel more. At this stage, you know, I was starting to feel more confused than I was getting answers, but clarity was definitely just around the corner. This next lesson was kind of a twofer actually because it started when I started this whole process and, and I started noticing in my training or any session that I was doing that when I got going there was an initial glucose dip. which. I know, makes sense because of course you're actually starting to use the blood glucose for your exercise. But then when you add that into another experience I had where I ran a marathon in Buriram as you do, but I wasn't racing it. So I didn't take it super seriously. I didn't take a gel before the event like I would do for a normal marathon. I wanted to see what happened to my blood glucose throughout that marathon if I was just running a little bit easier. Um, and here's the thing, the second part of this lesson I guess. I started that run, certainly not, I wouldn't call it in a completely fasted state as in I've just woken up from eight hours of sleep or, or whatever and had no breakfast. But there was a considerable amount of time between when I had eaten last to this race. So I was in a semi-fasted state. My body didn't have carbohydrates within the last hour or two. And I noticed that as well as the glucose dip, it actually took me really, really low into my blood glucose general levels, right? And then the gels that I was taking didn't really touch the sides as we've mentioned in a previous point. So I wasn't able to really get myself out of the hole that I'd put myself in from running in a semi-fasted state. And I thought to myself, that is gonna have quite serious ramifications if I did that in a race where I'm actually going for it, in a marathon where I want to run a PB or my, you know, certainly a fast time. So it, you put those two things together and you realize that a carb loading strategy before a race and then an in-race fueling strategy are so essential. I can't even tell you, I really genuinely believe that about 80% of people that run certainly long distance races like marathons under fuel and it's actually quite hard to over fuel as long as you get your training right and, and do all of the fueling in training it's quite difficult to over fuel but I suppose my point is if you're starting a hard session or if you're starting an important race from a place of semi-fasted or fasted and low blood glucose a there's going to be a dip before there is any substantial rise, and B, gels don't hit as hard as you think, so you really, really have to nail down these strategies. And if you wanna watch a video on in-race fueling, it's here. The final lesson I learned, which some of it you're definitely gonna know, and some of it will be interesting, is that Depending on the quality of food you eat is very dependent on what happens to your blood glucose. That bit is obvious, high quality food, low quality food, right? 
But what I also found was that even when you eat unprocessed, higher quality foods, you're going to have a different glucose reaction depending on the food, and perhaps even the order that you eat in. Orange juice is a great example of something we perceive as healthy, but the spike in glucose is huge, and then the crash the other side as well. Fruit generally does spike blood sugar more, but depending on how you eat it, wrapped up with oats and dairy as an example, can slow down the release to mean a nice stable energy level throughout the morning. That's called putting clothes on your carbs. I suppose generally what I'm looking for from the foods that I eat for life rather than simply for running is that it gives me energy throughout the entire day rather than the sharp spikes and the quite quick lows thereafter. So for an example, nice piece of rice here, protein on top. If I start with the protein and some fiber with the lettuce, it kind of encases the rice and then helps it release over a longer period of time, which is in my working life is what I want to have energy throughout the day. Other hacks to slow down the release of blood glucose is to have an order to what we eat, like maybe fibre first, then proteins and fats, and then starches and sugar. A tablespoon of vinegar in a glass of water has been proven to reduce meal glucose spike by up to 30% if you do it 20 minutes before, or even just good old movement after a meal. That's going to help control that spike. And all of these tips are very important if you are coming into an important session or a race. And if you've got this far in the video, it means you liked the video, or you liked us, or both. But if you did, then remember to subscribe to the channel, and you're probably also going to like this video, which was when we did 30 days of running 10 kilometers every single day to see what it would do to our running. A little spoiler, it did improve it. See you next week.